everyone. Let's call this meeting of uh, the Health and Human Services Committee to order. Uh, what? Is my mic on? It is on. Okay. Well, I'm down in the hole. Good afternoon, everybody. We are officially started on this uh, meeting of the Health and Human Services Committee. I'm calling it to order. Uh, first of all, if you're here for the physical therapy bill or, the, uh, or if you're an orthopedist, uh, that bill has been pulled. We are not hearing that bill uh, today. So, and you know, I want to say to the committee members, you're gonna find that many of these are subs. I want to say that we have the best lawyer of any of the other committees in the legislature with having Betsy. Yay for Betsy. And being so good means that everybody wants to use Betsy, which means that she's just been inundated with work and sometimes getting subs out way ahead of time is impossible to do. And I want to personally thank you, Betsy, for everything you do for this committee. But I did want people to understand, and also lobbyists and members of the committee, why you might be getting subs at the last minute, because we have covered her up this session. So uh, we will try to answer any questions that any of the members have. I have told uh, Chairman uh, Rogers that he can go ahead. So we are going to hear House Bill 416. Uh, Chairman Rogers. And are we working off, pardon? Go to your room, please. <laughs> Let's, okay. House Bill 416, are we working off LC 336015S? Okay, so we got a new sub. You're gonna have to tell us, make sure, read it out again, make sure everybody has the right Is it just missing from my folder? Does everybody else have it in their folder? Literally, things are coming hot off the press. In the last 30 minutes, okay. Oh, here it comes, everybody. You got the right LC? 83. Anybody else need it? Are you ready, Chairman Rogers? Okay, we got it? Uh, okay, Chairman Rogers. Turn him on. Uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, I, I have a substitute for you. The House Bill 416, LC336083S, called the Patient Information and Awareness Act. <laughs> Many of you who are on the committee last year, I know there are new members on here now, we did pass a similar bill, but I'm, I'm very happy to say that all groups are in support of the bill. So uh, we did work over it, over the interim and medical association, all parties involved. So this bill addresses the importance of healthcare consumers or patients having the necessary information about their providers training during their interactions each health care provider has specific training and are qualified to conduct certain medical and non-medical tasks for their patients. The general public is often unaware of the differences in training and their expectation for treatment and therapy and may not be consistent with the scope of practice for certain health care professionals. In those instances, the patient deserves to know the qualifications and limits to the care that a practitioner may provide this bill does not attack anyone's scope of practice. As a matter of fact, it is a bill that healthcare practitioners across the country have felt necessary in efforts to properly inform their patients and to maintain a safe environment for themselves through self-monitoring. 
At this point, there's 17 states that have already passed similar legislation, including Florida, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Louisiana. Those states have far more restrictions than this bill does. Patients have gone on record across the country stating that the desire to know the level of training of their health care provider has obtained 73%. 73%. The level of licensure is print ads, 89%. Want to see names on badges, 80%. Want to see the full title spelled out on name badges, 86%. Sur survey data states that only 33% of the respondents to a national survey understand medical titles abbreviation. DNP, comma, MA, comma, RN, comma, PA, comma, et cetera. What does this bill do? This bill requires all healthcare practitioners to wear identifying information during patient encounters, the information that must be apparent, our full name, degree, certification, role in healthcare setting. The information can either be a, on a lab coat or on a name tag. Tags are to be worn in the following practice settings, hospitals, private practices, nursing homes, assisted living, facilities, and personal care homes. The bill also requires that advertisements state that the type of licensure the health care <coughs> practitioners have earned. There are exceptions. Tags do not have to be worn. One, in an operating room, settings where surgical or invasive procedures are performed, mental health settings where the safety of the provider could be compromised by stating a full name. Health administrators who do not interact with patients do not have to wear them. Most importantly, facilities who already have an ID protocol in place are not bound by this bill. There are 16 other places in the Georgia Code of Regulation where tags are required. And I'd be glad to read them all, Madam Chair, but for the sake of time, I won't do that. But uh, I think everybody should understand the bill or have people address them on the concerns. So. Are you ready for questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, are there questions for the chairman? Representative Pack. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, chairman Rogers, just, just a quick question. Was there a, an incident that kind of spurned this type of legislation that well, where a patient got confused who was... And what harm I've had result. personal experiences myself, but uh, mm -hmm. what did you say, Dr. Hawkins? I said you were looking at it. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I've had personal experiences in hospital settings uh, that have, you know, it would be nice to know who, a, if a person is a physician or, you know, a Ph.D. in nursing or what they're in. So mm -hmm. I think the push across the country is to ID themselves, just like you and I wear name badges here in, in the state capitol. What, one question I have is um, with a different level of education, I'm willing to bet the consumer probably don't know what the level of training that they had. Frankly, I don't even know. Um, so I, apart from doctors and, and maybe specific nurses who are allowed to do specific things, beyond that I think the consumer might be confused because they're not educated as to like how what level of education and what they're allowed to do in the scope of practice that's, that's w only one concern that I have about okay. yeah but is there is there a way to accommodate uh, don't be thing? other people testifying on yeah. behalf of the bill that probably can explain that better than I can representative Pack. so yeah, thank you if you'll allow them to do so uh, representative Hawkins is it true that, uh, like Northeast Georgia and other hospitals already do this? Correct. And, and what your bill is, gonna, is doing is just verifying that all uh, institutions do this with the health care? That is correct. Thank yes. you. Representative Kidd. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one quick question, and I support your bill very much. On page 4, line 107, uh, this subsection shall not apply to health care practitioners or practices or facilities in which only one type of health care practitioner practices. So if a medical doctor is in a solo practice, is this exempt him? Where are you, on 107? Yes, sir. This, uh, the, last, the last sentence of that paragraph. Shall not apply to health care practices or facilities right. which only one type of health care practice. Right. I might be reading it wrong, but it looks like you're exempt. Well, that would be in a case of... Uh, 
optometrists only an office of optometry they would not have to they would not have to wear a name tag well, maybe, but if they're in a well, multiple multiple type specialty office with an ophthalmologist they would so a, a multi practice say a medical doctor in, in, in your general practitioner's office uh, he wouldn't have to wear one would his nurse or PA have to wear one if it's a, if, if the office is just for the one medical doctor it's only for one medical doctor <laughs> they would not have to as far as an optometrist is concerned well, how, about, how about an MD MD uh, Betsy you may have to help me on that one So if it was just the MD and he didn't have a nurse working for him or a PA working for him, he wouldn't have to, which obviously that's right. never going to take place. Representative Kidd, I think uh, some testimony, if the lady chair, uh, chair lady is going to allow testimony, can answer some of the questions or concerns you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Representative Peasel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Chairman, line 75, the identifier shall be of sufficient size. How do you define <coughs> sufficient size? Because if I'm, if I've got, you know, 2120 vision uh, sufficient size for me is is totally different from from someone else uh, I think a normal like the name tag you have now representative okay I think it would be bigger than a McDonald's name tag okay <laughs> maybe we need to address that in the McDonald's world <laughs> well you know it would right. be nice to know you know who's serving you and sure. stuff. but I think normal size and you know I, I wear glasses I can see your name I can't see it clearly but as long as it the rest of it is not important I promise okay <laughs> you said it I didn't say it. <laughs> I think that's one place where common sense hopefully yeah. would determine the size of the printing uh, representative Kelly pardon oh representative Bennett thank you madam chair <laughs> one question <laughs> pertaining to line 68 through 70 uh, whether it identifies who will be responsible for the identifier. Does this include home health practitioners or? Uh, yes, it would. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you, Representative uh, Chairman Rogers, for bringing this. I will tell the committee that last year I meet with the CEO of Wellstar every quarter. And right after this committee, I have a crossover day, and when this bill had not gone forward, uh, he came down to see me, and I talked to him about what I wanted to talk to him, and then he gave me a list of things that he wanted, and he was really interested in that bill for lactation specialist, because they want to become a center for excellence for uh, mothers and breastfeeding. And then I said, okay, what's next? You're a little late on that one. And he said, well, we're having a real problem with people knowing who's taking care of them, so I'm real interested in that name tag bill. And I said, well, you're too late for that one, too. So uh, at least the CEO of Wellstar sees the need for this. Okay, Carl Johnson, you'll come forward and identify yourself and uh, over at the mic. Okay, that's fine, either place. Madam Chairman, uh -huh. my name is Carl Johnson. I'm the uh, legislative chair for the Georgia Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. And uh, last year, we had some significant concerns about this bill, which we shared with some of the other people who practice psychotherapy in the state. Uh, Madam Chairman, you were very helpful in, um, in addressing some of those concerns, and I want to thank you for that, for your openness to working with us. And over the summer, Marcus at the Medical Association of Georgia um, worked with us, and, uh, and at this point, we have no problem with the bill. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. And that does it. Uh, Marcus Downs. Marcus? <coughs> they have you pinned in? No. He's doing something for me. Yes, ma'am. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Marcus Towns with the Medical Association of Georgia. Uh, we are in full support of the bill. Uh, I believe uh, Representative Rogers testified that 17 states right now, including uh, Louisiana, Virginia, Texas, uh, Florida, have uh, a very similar piece of legislation in place is actually a lot more restrictive than this presentation 
And uh, you know, we found in several instances there were at least four national surveys that have been conducted that highlight and underscore the importance of this. There was a question asked earlier whether or not there had been any instances where this had been problematic. Well, I'm not quite sure how many of you saw the expose from 2020, probably two or three weeks ago, but you had a 17-year-old child uh, who was impersonating an OBGYN <coughs> down in Osceola, Florida. And so what the expose highlighted was if, in fact, there were credentialing mechanisms in place, and they specifically said if there were name badges in place, then this perhaps would not have gone on. Uh, there's no telling how many patients that this 17-year-old child uh, actually touched or assaulted, committed a battery on. Uh, he's not qualified. Uh, there was also another question regarding the qualifications of, uh, of different health care providers. It is true, uh, many people may not be aware of the differences between, and I'll use uh, the difference of an orthopedic surgeon and a physical therapist. I've had orthopedic surgeons who've come to me and said that their patients had asked, are you the physical therapist or the orthopedic surgeon? Uh, there have been differences between the, an ophthalmologist and an optometrist. Many people may not know those differences. Many people will not know those differences until they're actually in that particular practice. And when they go for a certain type of care, perhaps laser treatment of some sort, they'll realize that there's a certain professional that can deliver that type of treatment, and then there's a certain professional uh, that would actually have to refer for that type of treatment. So these are all things that we believe the patient deserves to know. Uh, the patient has said that they want to know in all of these surveys, and better than 85% of the data that we've received says that this is important to the patient. This is purely a consumer uh, act for us. It is not something that attacks anyone's scope of practice. It is very important to highlight that. Uh, and so with that, I'd, I'd ask for your favorable support. Thank you. Jet Tony and Dr. Brown, Dr. Amanda Brown. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Jet Tony, representing the Georgia Society of Anesthesiologists, and it is my privilege to introduce the current president of the GSA, Dr. Amanda Brown. This is her first opportunity to appear before the committee in her role as the leader of the GSA. Oh, does that mean I have to tell everybody to be really nice to her? <laughs> no, we will be, Dr. Brown. Well, thank you so much. Um, my name is Amanda Brown. Um, I'm a physician anesthesiologist and I practice in Macon, Georgia at the Level 1 Trauma Center down there, Navicent Medical Center. I've been in practice there for about six years. Um, I come here in support of 416, and uh, again, this is a measure that's endorsed by the Georgia Society of Anesthesiology as well. Um, I'd like to just speak to a bit of why I came here today to speak on this bill. Um, it's really on behalf of the patients. I work in a very complex medical environment. The perioperative surgical home involves a multitude of different areas where a, f a patient interfaces with a multitude of uh, uh, providers. Uh, from the time they come in for a pre-surgical visit to the time they come in to check in for their surgery, throughout the time span of critical care that is the, the, the surgery itself, uh, they meet dozens of faces, and those faces potentially are nameless faces. The name badge with clearly identified credentials is what begins to give that environment definition and a and, uh, component of uh, security and safety. Um, my particular specialty is uh, neonatal anesthesiology. There is nothing more personal or demanding of a parent to transition their child to someone they don't know for a period of surgery. And to be able to see uh, rapidly who the person they're giving their child over to is, namely what their credentials of care are, um, it, it could not be more important. Um, this bill on face seems not necessarily that important but I wanted to uh, bring to, it, to your attention its dire importance and to ask for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Dr. Brown? Thank you, Dr. Brown, for coming and being a nurse, being in the hospital a lot with my husband a couple of years ago. There was something to be said for when we wore caps and one with a black stripe meant you were an RN and people knew who, whether it was an RN or an LPN, uh, or a nurse's aide with no cap that was taking care of them. Now you never know which level of care. So I'm very much in support of the bill. Do I have any, I'm now in the position, what is the pleasure of the committee? For approval do pass of LC 336083S. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, if I had, was recognized. 
Uh, I'm sorry, that's fine. <laughs> I have a motion to move. Do I hear a second? Okay, is there any further discussion from committee members? Questions? <laughs> Hearing no further discussion, everybody in favor of the passage for the substitute to House Bill 416 say aye. aye. Anyone opposed, no? Aye. Okay, the ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope you make your meeting on time. So, all right, who wants to go next? G. Okay, he has a. Okay, Representative Brockway, I hear you have a four o'clock meeting. Huh? No? You too? Okay. Okay. Representative Brockway, what's your meeting? Uh, got to present a bill with another committee. It'll take about five minutes, so whatever the will of the committee is, it's okay. allow me to dip out at five and come back at 405. That'll be fine, whatever, whatever you want. Okay. Uh, Representative Dodgins, what's your committee meeting? I'm supposed to be in education right now, helping work through the education meeting. Oh. Okay, I'm going to let, okay, I'm going to let uh, well, Representative Dudgeon go. Oh, okay. <laughs> Plus, mine was interrupted last time. Okay, don't push it. I'm being nice. Thank it's you. only because you sit by me and I'm I afraid know. you'll do something I to. Called in a favor after five years of sitting next to Madam Chair. <laughs> next to my chair. That, exactly. that gets some priority and she's sitting next to me on the floor. Okay, um, tell us which. Um, yeah, we're working off of a sub LC 336052S. 6052S. And Madam Chair, uh, at your discretion, since we did hear this bill pretty fully before we ran out of time a couple weeks ago, I will just summarize quickly and tell you the changes in the sub and then stand for questions instead of going back over everything. So, this is uh, House Bill 34 is the Georgia Right to Try Act. It essentially allows. Um, if all parties are willing access to experimental drugs or therapies which have passed FDA part one which is safety um, once they pass that again if the doctor hospital manufacturer and the patient all agree and sign written consent then they would be allowed access to these medications we've heard this bill has passed in five other states has been introduced in 20 something right now um, and is is sort of a trend that I think is going in the right direction so Madam Chair I'll highlight the the changes in the sub from last meeting um, on line 47, um, we define physician to be um, the article that talks about uh, medical doctors or doctors of osteopathic medicine just to make sure that the physician who was certifying this was that level of physician. Um, we tightened up the terminal illness um, language on 49. It used to be advanced illness. We made it clear it's terminal and um, talked about um, that disease will result in death in the near future. Um, is, is considered to be not reversible by current treatment. So we tightened up that definition a little bit. And the most curious thing is the wonderful, I mean, Council Betsy, as you've talked about, she works for education too, which is in my other committee I work a lot on, and she does a great job. She found, believe it or not, a sort of kind of right to try code that was already in the code from 1997, which in my non-attorney um, opinion was not very well written. Um, it was kind of generic, and I spoke with the chair about it, and we decided there. And so in line 4141, we were just going to repeal this old um, right to try um, um, code section, which, again, it didn't have the liability protection, didn't have a lot of the procedures. It really was not, I don't think, as well thought out. So I would offer to the committee that, that, that especially this House Bill 346052S is a vast improvement on the current code section. Again, we have liability protection. We have um, strong written consent and all the things we want in that kind of environment. And I'm aware um, there's an amendment the chair asked me to work on, AM 33-1505, um, that I would ask the committee's favorable support for. Um, this uh, amendment uh, basically says that there's also no cause of action for lawsuits if a physician declines to recommend a drug. What we don't want to get in a situation is where um, a patient sees a particular therapy and they want it and the physician doesn't think it's the right idea, we don't want to create a big lawsuit battle. We really want this to be very much, Madam Chair and committee members, very much around a voluntary situation where every, all the parties agree it's the best thing for the patient and we want to allow that to move forward. Um, there is another amendment floating around that I, I do not support and I guess we'll talk about that at the correct time. So, Madam Chair, I'd be glad to end for questions um, at this time. Questions from the committee? No questions from the right. committee. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, all right. Represent Representative Peasel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative. 
if if I uh, choose to take a non FDA approved drug, yes. uh, would my insurance company be able to um, refuse to pay for any symptoms? Absolutely. The um, there's explicit language in here which says that the insurance company is not required to pay. I'm trying to find that section. Can you find that line? Yeah. One ten. Yeah. Health benefit plan provides coverage. Yeah. Nothing in the chapter shall be construed to require a health benefit plan or government agency to provide coverage. So okay. there's no one required. Thank you, Representative. Sure. Okay. Uh, Representative Hawkins. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> on line 136, you referred to a code section 51 1-27 and so on. This is about the liability uh, area. I have great concern always, you know, it, as a dentist, we're told we can have a con signed consent form and it's not worth a whole lot, mm -hmm. um, keeping us from out of a court case. Can you tell me about these code sections or is this going to be pretty ironclad that we're not going to have a physician yeah. drug in or a pharmacist? Or I, will, I will tell you, Dr. Hawkins, that, that section 133, uh, section B there, has um, we worked with the past several weeks with um, – trial lawyer groups and with the physician groups and with the hospital groups around this liability language. Right. Um, this language is the one that the doctors and MAG, I believe, will testify that they support this language. We, we, we had okay. disagreement between the trial lawyers and the doctors, and, and I had to break the tie. Unfortunately, I broke the tie in the, in the favor of the, of the doctors. I think there is other language that may be proposed by some, some folks, which would be the trial lawyer's language. Again, I, I would prefer the doctor's language. So I think Marcus will testify that this is, in the judgment of the doctors, this is the liability yeah. language okay. they would like. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bill Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I'm Bill Clark on behalf of the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association. I want to start by uh, thanking Representative Dudgeon. He called us in early on this bill. Uh, he knew that there was potential for disagreement on what level of liability ought to be in the bill. Um, and so I just I thank him for uh, inviting us to be a part of the discussion. This is an important piece of legislation and will allow a lot of Georgians who need access to drugs to have access to drugs and to have it voluntarily. The bill has, though, only one patient safety measure in it. And what I'm here to talk about is an amendment uh, that I believe one of your colleagues will offer. Uh, through your staff, we've made it available to the entire committee. But there's only one provision in the bill right now that amounts to patient safety. And that is a requirement that the physician, in consult with the patient, let the patient know what the risks are and make the medical determination that the patient should have the drug. That's a very important component of the bill. Frankly, it's a very important component of the federal law uh, after which this bill is mirrored that allows for compassionate use, compassionate access to experimental drugs. Unfortunately, on lines 133 through lines 137, this bill eviscerates that patient safety. It guts that patient safety provision and says, as long as you've got informed consent, you can recommend without any accountability whatever experimental drug you believe uh, is in the best interest of your patient. We believe that the bill ought to allow for voluntary access to the drugs, but it ought to continue to require the physician to exercise her professional judgment and to make an informed decision to advise her patient. What this bill says is you can make the recommendation and there's no accountability if you don't follow the standard of care. Now typically physicians when they are sued and, and someone wants to hold them accountable for uh, malpractice, that doctor is judged against how other doctors would generally treat a patient. They look at other doctors in general what we've suggested is language that doesn't compare the recommending physician to the whole world of physicians, but only compares them to other physicians who would recommend treatment with experimental treatments. So it's a very narrow comparison. Now I'm not going to tell you that our language or their language or any language is going to get a doctor sued. I can't imagine that one of my members would take this case, and I know no jury would likely find a physician liable 
under my language or their language. But the public policy of the state still ought to say, we want physicians to comply with the applicable standard of care. We don't want them, even in this desperate situation that a patient with a terminal condition has, we don't want doctors to be able to turn a blind eye to their professional obligation. And it's our belief that the language on lines 133 uh, through 170, 137 says, give it your best shot, doc. We're not going to hold you accountable. We don't believe that that's the appropriate patient safety measure. And so the language that we've recommended, and I believe Representative Kelly has uh, <clears throat> excuse me, agreed to offer uh, the amendment, and boiled down what it says is, doc, when you're recommending these experimental treatments, you have to provide that degree of care, skill, and diligence ordinarily employed by health care providers when providing treatment to a patient using an experimental treatment. That's all we've said. We haven't said that you've got you to follow long-standing medical practices. These are unique to medical practice. It is, by definition, an experimental drug. And so we've said don't, don't compare them to the world. Compare them to what other physicians recommending experimental treatments would follow. But the state of Georgia ought to continue to require our physicians to follow that standard of care. It's the only patient safety measure. Nobody says, well, let's just let them take snake oil and the state's going to turn a blind eye to it. Instead, oh, I don't know. We, yeah, some of our bills. Nobody in this legislation <laughs> says that. That's not at all Representative Dudgeon's intent. Representative Dudgeon's intent is to allow these folks in desperate situations to have access to experimental drugs. We believe they all should have a state public policy set saying that if a physician makes the recommendation, they're doing so in compliance with the applicable standard of care. I'm so, glad to answer any questions. I appreciate the time, Madam Chair. And so Chair. you're speaking just to the amendment, the, the balance of the bill? We have no opposition to the bill at all. We believe it, it's well intended and can help a lot of Georgians as long as we don't gut the patient safety provision that the federal law as well as the rest of this bill uh, would require. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Clark? Okay. Thank you, Madam no Chair, members of the committee. Uh, okay. Uh, David Hayes. If you'll identify yourself and who you're with. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is David Hayes. I'm here on behalf of Mag Mutual Insurance Company. Um, I have not seen the um, amendment that uh, Mr. Clark refers to, um, and I don't want to speak to it without running it up the flagpole, but I, I will tell you this. We do support um, the bill as is currently written, and specifically, we support the language starting at uh, line 133. Um, and we support that because this bill is about giving patients opportunity to access drugs, treatments that they would otherwise not have. And we think that the language as written gives physicians and other providers the protection that they need in order to recommend to these patients those experimental drugs, devices, treatments that may benefit these eligible, <coughs> eligible patients. Sorry. This language, starting in line 133, does not create blanket immunity for physicians. Okay, it's important that we keep in mind that this, this bill will only be, only apply in very narrow set of circumstances, and in turn, doctors will only be protected in those very narrow set of circumstances. Um, when we talk about standard of care, and standard of care is what is currently employed in malpractice litigation, and what we have here in this situation is we have patients who need treatments, drugs, devices that there's no standard for. There's nothing to compare what the physician did. The language is not as hollow as it might sound listening to Mr. Clark. There's actually, it's hinged on informed consent and there's actually eight hoops that the physician has to jump through. One of which is agreeing with the patient after an explanation of the risks of the patient's terminal illness, an explanation of the risks of the experimental drug device treatment, an agreement and an understanding that the risks of the drug and device are not do not outweigh the risks of the terminal illness. Appreciate Representative Dudgeon for bringing this uh, bill forward. We support the rest of the bill um, and the, the, the current form of the bill. As I've said, I haven't seen the uh, amendment, but I'm 
open to questions if there are any. Um, Mr. Hayes, I have a question. I really tried to think through this bill, and I'm, I don't know how to phrase this question. I guess what I'm worried about, if we go with the stricter language, and I can understand Mr. Clark's uh, concern about that, but if we're going to compare people, it would be like I would go to my oncologist who is just a practicing oncologist and ask to try this experimental drug. And then if something happened, my oncologist who just practices out at Wellstar, let's say I have one, I don't have one, thank God, uh, would then perhaps, if you couldn't find an other oncologist to compare, might be compared, is it possible they would be compared with somebody doing research in a medical center, which would be at a higher, more sophisticated, is that possible knowledge of how to deal with drugs like that and might be found lacking or, I mean, I think that's my concern about who we're comparing apples to apples or oranges to apples. I, I don't, uh, I'm not Chair, expressing myself well. You are, and the frustration in crafting the question is really an example of why the current language needs to remain in the bill because what do you compare an oncologist in Marietta who is recommending an experimental drug, who do you compare that to? Um, standard of care is all about similar circumstances and um, there are no similar, similar circumstances with experimental treatments. Um, and the risk is that you, um, if you have the comparison language in the bill, has been as has been described that you're not going to have anything to compare to and that we're going to end up with the same low threshold that we have in malpractice litigation or on the other hand we could have doctors just refusing to recommend something because they are afraid that if something went wrong they would be right. held to maybe academia a comparison and therefore would just take the simpler way out by not recommending uh, thank you very much for that that it on okay uh, any thank you madam chair who said something to me oh representative pack quick question um if lines 133 to 139 is not in the bill would that pretty much make the bill useless i guess the doctors are not going to prescribe it uh representative pack i would suggest uh that's probably there's probably a good chance of that I mean the, the point is we need to be able to mm -hmm. provide some protection to physicians so that they right. feel comfortable recommending these right. experimental treatments uh, one question if you look at line 131 this perhaps to the author here so you have the drug manufacturers have a defense if have if they act in good faith with terms of this chapter but you don't have the same kind of good faith defense for the physician it's almost like as um, long as you get a signed waiver, then you're, you're, go you're good. Um, is there a reason why there's a little bit, what I consider to be slight inconsistency there? It seems to me we're giving the drug manufacturer more protection than the, than the physician. Betsy? Uh, I mean, I can't comment on that if you want, Madam Chair. But okay. Um, my comment, Representative Pack, would be that um, the rest of this bill came together pretty easily. This liability section took several I think we had about 10 different versions of this language, and um, this ended up being the language that um, had the most agreement other than the trial lawyers. And so I, I can't tell you why there's not a good faith clause other than that um, the manufacturers were comfortable with A and the doctors were comfortable with B. Okay. Any further questions? All right. Uh, we do have a couple of amendments, but first of all, we'll take a stance on the bill. What's no. the pleasure of the committee? We have a motion that we um, yeah, that we all right, fine. <clears throat> and we have a motion and a second for the passage of the substitute to House Bill 34. And now we have amendments. Uh, Representative, do you want to present your first amendment? Your amendment. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, AM 331505, you and I discussed this amendment a little bit earlier. Um, this essentially 
um, takes care of the other liability situation where um, you don't want a patient to have the ability to sue a doctor because he won't sign off on a particular therapy. So, so I'd, I ask the committee's favorable recommendation for this. That's amendment AM 33-1505. Correct. Has everybody got it? Bracket. Okay. Okay. It, okay. This would be an addition inserting between lines 132 and 133 the following. This chapter shall not be construed to create a private cause of action against a physician who refuses to recommend an investigational drug, biological project, uh, product, or device for any otherwise eligible patient. So it allows the p physician to have discretion. Mm -hmm. Do I hear a motion on the bill, on the amendment? Okay, I've got a due pass. Do I have a second one? Okay, I have a due pass and a second. Any discussion on the amendment? Everyone in favor of AM 331505 say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? No. Okay, the ayes have it. That amendment's in. Was it Representative Kelly? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Present your amendment. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to offer uh, this uh, amendment uh, here at, that uh, Mr. Clark referred to, which is based off something that we've seen uh, since really the beginning of tort law, which is really where we just asked doctors. Originally, it was specified that we asked doctors and medical professionals to act in accordance with the others that are in their area. Okay. It's really the, the local practice doctrine, which said that if a doctor in one part of the country had one standard, uh, this is at the very beginning, beginning, acted one way and it was the standard of care there, that they wouldn't be held to the same standard as a doctor in another part of the country where the standard of care may differ. And we're drawing something that's analogous here, which is what we're saying is all we're asking is the doctors that are gonna practice in this field to exercise the same standard of care as other doctors that are uh, in this field. And, and I think, you know, as we as we look at it, we remember that the the plaintiff's going to bear the burden of proof to first show that they've that they violated that uh, standard of care and offer that up by expert testimony and allow a jury uh, of of their peers to make a determination of whether uh, there has been a violation. It's far from a slam dunk just by allowing the patient uh, this extra bit of safety, and that's why I would uh, ask that that the standard of care us look at the standard of care that the doctor just exercised the same standard of care as any other uh, medical professional that was practicing in this field. So what you're putting forth is amendment LC33605-2S? Yes, Madam Chair. Has everybody got a copy and had an opportunity to read it? That's the number. That's the number. That's the number. That's the number. Oh, this is the bill number. Okay. Yeah. All right, it that's doesn't have a number. The amendment. It doesn't have, the amendment doesn't have a number. Okay, you want to read it? I'll read it. Um, so we would strike lines 133 and 137 in their entirety and replace with the following. No person or entity providing treatment to an eligible patient using an investigational new drug, biological product, or medical device pursuant to this chapter shall be liable to a patient for injury or death resulting from harm done as a result of the investigational new drug, biological product, or medical device unless it is shown that the person or entity failed to treat that patient with that degree of care, skill, and diligence ordinarily employed by healthcare providers providing treatment to a patient using an investigational new drug, biological product, or medical device under similar conditions and like surrounding circumstances. So again, Madam Chair, we're just asking uh, for the standard of care to be that, that as any other uh, medical professional would exercise in this same arena. Okay. Uh, questions from the committee, Representative Kidd. Uh, yes, uh, the gentleman offering the amendment. Would, uh, how would you feel if your amendment uh, was changed to also use similar language on line 136 and 137? That'd be changed a little bit, or, uh, referring to a written consent. So you put or, or either and, obtain the written consent. That's, you know, one of the major, you know. Well, I, I think I would prefer the, the amendment as it is because I, I just feel that an individual who is suffering this terminal illness and they're, you know, they've exhausted all remedies at, at this point, and so they're trying something so investigational 
uh, at this point, I think you know most anybody's could go in and sign just an informed consent, waiving their rights because they're so desperate at this point. And so that's why I would I would prefer the amendment uh, as it is. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you wouldn't Madam Chair, if I may, one, one last question? Wouldn't you think that uh, the one of the appropriate standards of care uh, would be the proper discussion with the patient of what the drugs are, and therefore obtain the informed consent? Uh, at that time i would say that if you want to talk about informed consent you would you know the informed consent would be part of the standard of care that we're referencing there without having to even have it mentioned well what's wrong with mentioning it then i don't i would rather have this language than the informed consent all right thank you madam thank you madam chair okay representative pack um to the to the offer of the amendment would you consider instead of doing the a uh the amendment add in line 137 after the 3150-5 put a comma and put the words and fail to exercise reasonable care to be consistent with the language in li lines 131 to 132 which i think would capture the essence of what you're trying to get at i would represent the pack and just adding that to the language in, in the bill yes uh, where? at the uh, end of line 137 okay add what are you after the code sections 31-50-5 eliminating the period and inserting a comma and adding the language and fail to exercise reasonable care period which seems to me is consistent with the language that's contained in 131 to 132 which I believe everybody agreed to I would take that as a as a friendly change representative Dajun so what you're saying, committee members, is you would discard the original Kelly Amendment and just use the PAC Amendment instead? Is that what we're hearing? Is that what That's we're saying? my proposal. I think that, that uh, if he's my suggestion, I, I think, captures. Uh, He'll withdraw his amendment okay. if that's. BJ's offering that as an amendment. I would certainly prefer the PAC Amendment to the Kelly Amendment by a long shot. Um, I will only comment that we negotiated this for six weeks and without having to talk to the doctor's group and things like that I don't I can't speak for them and I would not want to sabotage the bill based on that um, but I definitely prefer the PAC amendment to the Kelly amendment okay so withdrawing. I'll withdraw mine and, okay and representative I'll Kelly BJ's. okay representative Kelly has withdrawn it and so we have the PAC now a PAC amendment and read it one more time okay. in line 137 strike the period insert a comma and insert the following language and fail to exercise reasonable care insert okay. period okay all right is there any comment any questions anybody to representative pack do i have anyone from the audience that wants to comment on it nobody wants to comment okay so oh i'm sorry Thank you. Representative Pack, yes. I'm not an attorney. Can you explain to the committee is, I would think, and I'm not an attorney, the reasonable care would mean that you see the patient in the hospital, that you 
do the routine things you would normally do in caring for a patient. Not exactly. I, I, I foresaw the situation. It seems the concern is that we, we want to make sure that the doctors are not just hastily without even really doing any research or understanding the impacts of the investigative drug, just going ahead and agreeing with the, with the patient to do that. And I thought that was kind of the concern. It seems to me that I think any doctor who is considering this would do their due diligence and the only the one of the ways to make sure that they do that is that they exercise reasonable care, which any doctor would do when they're prescribing something like this. I think it's outside the norm. So I thought it, it looks like they agree to the language in line 131, 132 for drug manufacturers and, and accept that the language has exercised reasonable care. It seems to me that should be a similar standard for the doctors. And that I, hopefully that will provide some protection. And, and address some concern and try to move this, what I consider to be a very good piece of legislation along. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. Representative Hawkins. You know, <clears throat> I'm not an attorney, and, and uh, we spoke about this on the floor, and I appreciate Representative Pack um, trying to help this bill. But I guess I, I, I sort of look back and, and see a lot of advertising on television now about suing physicians for things that were standard of care five and ten years ago. And I think if the physicians are, are comfortable with this language, I don't know that we need to mess with any language, any of this language, because I tell you, this is just maybe a stretch for a physician. And you're talking about a terminally ill patient, whether it be cancer or ALS. And, and I think to impede that treatment for that patient would, would be harmful. Okay. Uh, Mr. Downs, I see you standing in the wings there. You have something to add? Yes, ma'am. I appreciate it. I didn't. I, I apologize. I was out of the room a little bit earlier, uh, but I do want to thank Representative Dudgeon for this. He was very patient with us uh, in seeking our uh, our position on his on his language. He was very gracious to accept the changes that we submitted along with Mag Mutual, and we contend that standard of care is not uh, apples to apples on this. If it's an investigational drug. Uh, then we contend that there's likely no standard of care. I would, I would respectfully uh, submit that um, there may be other individuals, uh, other physicians across the country uh, practicing medicine, the same type of medicine, but that does not mean that they are trying the same investigational drug. I would further submit that if, in fact, they are uh, looking at a drug that has only gone through the first phase of FDA approval, it is not likely that there will be a standard of care to, to be met on that front as well. So, uh, you know, again, you know, we support the language that Representative Dudgeon has submitted. Um, you know, again, you know, we've talked with the trial lawyers. You know, they've been very gracious <coughs> as well. This is an area Sorry. where we just agree to disagree. Uh, but, you know, it is most important to us that we make sure that our physicians are not penalized uh, for providing uh, a recommendation. I, the last thing that I would say is m more, t more times than not, what's going to happen is a patient is actually going to go to a physician. What that patient is going to say is, I've tried everything that's been FDA approved. Nothing's working. I was looking on Google. I found this, and here we are. And then that physician is going to say, oh, well, I have read about this. Here are the pros. Here are the cons. Here's our informed consent, which means that the patient is fully aware of what they are about to endeavor on. And, and you know, that's, that's where I'll close. But, but, but thank you, Representative Dudgeon. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the position, we I don't see any other questions. Uh, let me stop for a minute. Representative Brockway, do you need to go present a bill in another committee and come back? I think we're going to be here. Yeah, I mean, don't take an hour to do it, but <laughs> go and come back. Sorry, Buzz. Just in case we start going fast. Got you. Thank you. Okay, Hi, you're welcome. Uh, okay, the stance we're in then, we have uh, Representative Pack's amendment to consider. Uh, do I hear a motion? And we moved and got a mo moved, and we have a second. Okay, any further discussion? All right. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that, BJ, your amendment, does it take into consideration what MAG has just said, and does that clear that up or no? Because that's what I'm not clear about. I'm not sure if the trial lawyers, with your amendment, actually it clears up with uh, MAG what they, they want as well. Okay, for now. I envision um, language like requiring just reasonable care would make the doctor actually read about the treatment they found on Google and understand and be able to explain pros and cons of taking it. I think, 
I thought that's kind of what, what we're trying to do, right? I'll get it done. <laughs> or if it doesn't, okay. okay. Do I need to? I'm sorry, I was being asked. Yeah. Representative Stevens had to leave to go chair committee, so I, I lost that. Do I need to get? I know. I, yeah. Do I need to get Mr. Downs to say something about that? Mr. Downs, did you hear the PAC, proposed PAC amendment? Not in its entirety. Okay, well, it, it's very short. Representative <laughs> PAC, would you tell Representative, I mean, uh, Mr. Downs, what your amendment is? Certainly. All it does is adds the language in line 137 after the code section 31-50-5. It says, and fail to exercise reasonable care, which is exactly the same language that you approved in lines 131 to 132. Well, I'm not willing to say that we approved that language. Our concern was not particularly about the investigational drugs as much as it was the physicians that we represent. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd have to run it up the flagpole with my membership. Okay. Uh, you know, I would I would hate to <coughs> agree, and there be something that I haven't caught. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it's left up to the committee. All right, uh, what do we got? Who, uh, Representative Sharpe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. But on that pack um, substitute, it does sound like the physician would feel like he's a little bit more liable. You know, that's that's exactly what it does. It says, man, I don't know, I don't want to touch this because now I'm more liable. I would agree. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Right, Representative Reinders. Thank you so much. This is this is great discussion and great debate. I, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to defer to the author of the bill because if this is something that holds it up or is something that's worthy of discussion, I know it'll happen in the Senate. So I'm going to ask you honestly, and we don't want to kill the bill one way or the other because the bill needs to pass. Um, so I'm going to ask you yes or no. Do, do, you, do you want the amendment? No. Thank you. Okay. The posture. The Representative Pax amendment, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? <laughs> Seeing no further discussion, get that in quickly. <laughs> Rosie, you can't put your hand down. <laughs> I'm teasing. Uh, otherwise, somebody send out for dinner. Uh, this is where we're going. Um, everybody in favor of the pack of amendment, raise your hand. Okay. okay. Everyone opposed. Okay. The opposition has it. The pack amendment fails. Okay. Now we're to the bill. I end up with my amendment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, we're back now to the passage of the substitute to House Bill 34 as amended. Do I have a due pass? Do I have a second? Got lots of seconds. Is there any further discussion? Okay, no raised hands all. So everyone in favor of the passage of the substitute to House Bill 34 as amended, say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? No. Okay, the ayes have it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Buzz okay, Rockway. let's see who we who we have left. <laughs> Was he back? No. 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 Okay, Representative Dempsey. Why is that? Okay. While she's getting up, may I add support? Okay, this is House Bill 288. The substitute to House Bill 288, it's LC 430111S. You ready? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chairman. 
Um, we have before you a substitute, and I'll, I'll explain that briefly, that the day that this bill was dropped, the day following it, another measure um, was filed, which would add another position to the Behavioral Health Coordinating Council, not connected to the one we are. So that's why we stepped in and did the substitute. Basically, the Coordinating Council was developed in regards to the 2009 General Assembly establishing the Behavioral Health Coordinating Council. It was House Bill 228 at that time. It reorganized and reestablished Georgia State Georgia State um, Health Plan, Health and Human Services Agency. The council is a very collaborative group of people. If you look at the substitute, you will see there listed everyone who currently is on the council. And then we'll be adding two new members. We decided to make that at the discretion of the governor simply because things change. This is a part of our very, very changing and challenging mental health and developmental disability um, council. So to have those people in place who also serve, as you will look, most of them are also heads of our agencies. We have the Commissioner of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, Community Affairs, Community Health, Corrections, Human Services, Juvenile Justice, Labor, Public Health, the State School Superintendent, the State Chair of the Board of Pardons and Paroles, um, a member of the House of Representatives, a member of the Senate, the Disability Services Ombudsman, an Adult Consumer Public Behavioral Health Services, a family member of Consumer Public Behavioral Health Services, and a parent of a child receiving public health behavioral services. As I said, House Bill 310, which dropped the day after the original filing of this bill, will add um, the creation of the Department of Community Supervision, and that bill includes specific to it to add that commissioner to this board as well. So while that is not included in this, that would add three people at the end if that bill passes, which is completely separate. Um, we will be leaving this up to the discretion of the governor to decide which two people might be best to add. It should not cost a thing because all of these are people who are doing it in the purview of their regular job. Okay. Questions for the representative? Chairman Dempsey. No one has any. Re representative Peasel. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Representative Dempsey, so how many people are on this uh, on this council now? There's a total of 16. So this will move it to 18. It will with these two. It would move it to 18. Okay. Thank you. And I will tell you, it is a very collaborative group. I am the appointee from the house that serves on it, and the work I believe that they are able to accomplish together, sitting around that table, is pretty unprecedented. Representative Pruitt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just curious why you feel the need to add additional people. There are different voices that move in and out of the needs to address developmental disabilities and behavioral health and addictive services. It changes at times, and while all of these that are listed in statute should remain there, there may be some different um, <coughs> educational voices um, as we continue to chase sort of the evolving challenges of the develop uh, of the Department of Justice settlement and moving everyone that we need to into different services in Georgia. Madam Chair, follow up, please. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering. A lot of our times we have committee meetings. It's hard to get everybody there. Is that an issue too of having another? It, ab it absolutely is. Okay. It Thank absolutely you. Absolutely is. However, I will say they're pretty active. They are pretty faithful. Okay. Representative Kaiser. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, actually. My seatmate here asked my question, but I guess I'm wondering if there's a little more clarification in the two additional appointments as far as what, you know, what credentials, I guess, would the governor be looking for? Or is it just, could it just be any two pay people with, I mean, I, mean, I guess I, what concerns me that there's nothing spelled out that has anything to do with their credentials pertaining to this particular um, group, because you have everyone else spelled out very 
somewhat specifically. And if you would allow me, I'd like to let Andrew answer that question who works for the department. My name is Andrew Johnson. <coughs> Uh, with the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. Um, our idea, we were approached by uh, several advocates for behavioral health services who came to us and some said, well, what about the, uh, the head of vocational rehab? Well, what about the head of reentry? What about the head of, of this? That, that do pertain to this and without having a council that has 30 people on it, um, we, we felt that uh, these two positions at the discretion of the governor um, would would facilitate that uh, odds are we we might be involved in and does that fit the subject of the time that the council is working on can i just follow up madam chairwoman okay. that answers my question that's i i like the answer but i i guess my concern is do those appointments rotate at all how long are these appointments how long do the appointments last uh i believe currently they're uh I don't have the bill. Currently, they are, uh, let me see the bill, either two or three years. Okay, so there is a period of time. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Representative Kelly. I'll wait. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Is, the, is there any specific deficiency, for lack of a better word, that what are we what are we not able to do on this council now that we will all of a sudden be able to do with with these two additional the original if you look before the substitute i don't know if you have that in your folder at all but the original which was just the exact same mm -hmm. almost composition of a bill spoke to adding two specific positions one was the uh director of the governor's office of student achievement and the other was the Deputy Commissioner of Workforce Division of the Georgia Department of Economic Development. So it's dealing with the education and workforce issues. However, once this new um, department might possibly be established, it was just felt that at this time, with that bill moving also somewhat parallel to this, that we leave it open and allow the governor to use his discretion to do that. You know, the intent is just to make sure that we ensure the representation of key stakeholder sure. groups around the table. So that, and, and that can change from time to time. Absolutely. I, I guess my concern is I've been on, on boards and councils in the past where there's just too many cooks in the kitchen right. and uh, it kind of leads to inertia. Well, what I, what I found as I said serving on this is that this is such a wide encompassing um, challenge that we are taking on as a state. I'm sure that each of you within your own districts hear very frequently from people with mental health and developmental disabilities and the challenges that are there. So as we try to do that and do that well for Georgia, I think the more that are around this particular table that touch it in any way, we are able to sort of coordinate and maximize the effectiveness of the challenges that we're all trying to work together. Thank you, ma'am. I think you answered my question. I mean, as far as terms, obviously, the, f the first aforementioned people, Commission of Public Health, Community Health, their term is going to be as long as they have that position. But these two were adding, and then the parent and child, uh, uh, parent of a child, and, and so on. <laughs> two to three years is what I'm hearing, the term? Yes, sir. I don't, I don't see it in this. And, uh, Approximately. It's in the original. Approximately. Okay. Original. That's fine. Thank you. I think my question was answered too in the piece uh, about education. Was there any representatives from the public education system uh, represented on this board? They are. They okay. are. Right. Very important part of right. the discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to the author, um, I was just looking at the um, the members that comprise this 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 council and. Um, Although most of them are part of the council by virtue of their positions, um, with the exception of the labor commissioner and the state school superintendent, uh, most of them are already appointed by the governor. And so I'm curious as to why it wasn't considered perhaps that these other two appointments, if we consider them, why weren't perhaps one be appointed by the lieutenant governor and one by the, uh, by the speaker? 
Well, I think it all really goes back to the original draft, actually, of the bill. There were two very specific people who would be in place because they were put in the jobs by the governor. Mm -hmm. So it allows for him to continue to do that. Mm. In order to not be, I mean, the goal is not to have necessarily another consumer or another advocate because they are represented there. So it is to appoint someone by virtue of their position and service within the state <coughs> and the entity that they represent. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Lady Dempsey, uh, first of all, I appreciate what you, all that you do for DBHDD and understand that department very well. Um, but I wanted to ask you, have you considered maybe, you know, two new members? There's no provider representation on here. And, of course, all of the services that individuals receive in the community, uh, providers are, are, are directly working with, uh, with families every day, uh, kind of from the bottom up. Uh, was there any thought to maybe making one of those appointments someone who is actually providing services in the community? And I know that speaks to some questions we've already had, like John's question. But... Um, did you give that any thought, or is there any, has there been any discussion about, about that? Well, there are two areas specifically, as I look at it, that I think do um, have some oversight in that, and that would be the Disability Services Ombudsman. They certainly work closely with providers to make sure that that's being carried out. The <coughs> adult... Um, the ombudsman actually are advocates. I mean, they do work with providers, I guess, but they're, they they're, they're, they're really purely advocates. Uh, rights focused advocates and and so you have a lot of that on there and that's a good thing but I just wonder Andrew any comment about that yeah and representative Peter thank you uh, I think uh, as written it is a, a bit open-ended and that has more to do with the fact that we were approached by several advocates who said well what about this agency what about this agency what about this person right and um, we, we felt quite honestly that that would accomplish any of the above or if in the future sure. while for instance, workforce is a is a key issue for our department right now. Maybe it's something different in six sure. in six years from now. Yeah. And, uh, and and whatever the topic is at the time, we felt that that those appointments for those subject matter experts could be accomplished at that time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, you led me where I was going anyway. Six years from now, and then earlier we said, well, we might we don't want thirty. How long is this? So, I mean, my purpose isn't to just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. How long has this council been around? This council was established in 2009 when the, uh, uh, when the departments, the human services and health departments were split out. It was established in 2009. And, and, and I get it because Student Finance Commission, was there any time in 2011 says we need a Student Finance Commission on there? I mean, what happened to all of a sudden say in 20... 15 we need this now two more spots and, and based on what you just said how do we know it ain't four more two years from now well and and i will i probably should have said this right up front it meets quarterly it's not a constant meeting group so we come <laughs> together on a quarterly fashion to to reassess and look um i think that the challenge of this area is something that continues to change all the time. I don't think the intent is to. So it could grow to thirty. Mr. Chairman, I, I mean, could. Mr. Chairman, I would, I would suggest that the two members appointed that, that hopefully we could accomplish by changing those members. Uh, it would be that was kind of our thought when we did this, but I certainly understand what you're saying. I, it, it, to say it won't do this, and to say, but we might want to grow it. I'm trying to wrap my mind around which one is the actual thing. And finally, you said there was a companion piece of legislation. Original bill? It's not. It's there is original bill. Who was well, it, it says exactly the same. Yeah, thing. who is carrying that? I was. Okay. So and this is, is this the governor's bill? <laughs> no, this is our department's bill. But okay. This is not part of the administration package. Okay. So. Thank you. Sharper, you're going to get the last word on this. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just from what I'm hearing right now, even from the members and also, you know, from you guys a little bit, is it a possibility that you can table this and get a little more input and address some of the issues of the people <coughs> on the committee, uh, some of their concerns? Representative Sharper, you're not, <laughs> in case you're thinking about making that motion, I'm not going to recommend <laughs> that motion. Okay. 
Now, I mean, we, we're so late in the in the, in the And let me tell you, I think this goes to prove there is no simple bill. That's a one pager, and there were 16 people on this committee that asked questions about it. Oh, no. Representative Dempsey, be careful what you bring before me again, will you please? Sorry, it really is. This okay, <laughs> there's nobody in the out of the and the audience that wants to speak to this bill. <laughs> Representative Hatchett. Chair. Thank you, Chairman Dempsey, for your work on this bill. And at the appropriate time, I would like to make a motion to do pass on this it bill. Is the, I got a, all right, it is the appropriate time. I've got a motion so to do pass and a second. Is there any further discussion from any of the other members of the committee that haven't already spoken? No further questions. Okay, the position is everyone in favor of the substitute to House Bill 288, say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed, no. Okay, the, the eyes have it. Thank you very much. I'm going to watch this table go over your vote. <laughs> <coughs> okay, have we got Representative Bro uh, Brockway back? Okay. That was a nice move. That was a nice move by a floor leader, by the way. Okay. That's good politics right there. Okay, Representative Clark. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm so sorry, everybody. Uh, we got House Bill 436. Get in here somewhere. This is a bill that passed out of this committee. It went to rules. We had a. Uh, I guess we were all reading a double words when it said HIV syphilis and it got left off, so it's really a drafting correction with one smaller change. Go uh, ahead. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chair. Um, this uh, is a change. It's substitute to House Bill 436. Our physicians requested that we add syphilis to um, before birth, and it was added to the third trimester, and again, it, it's asked that it be added before birth. We have a great number of syphilis cases in Georgia. We have children born to mothers with untreated syphilis, and those children, again, experience blind, blindness, deafness, and deformity. So we're um, hoping that this will lower that number of children born to mothers with syphilis. They can be treated, and uh, the antibiotic is safe during pregnancy. Okay. So it's just a matter of adding the word syphilis. Did you yes, have an is. amendment? Was it left off Madam somewhere Chair, else again? Madam Chair, I do again? have a, a, an amendment with your advice. I wonder if, if, if um, you would consider adding syphilis to line 16 in the first testing, and that oh. would allow okay. a greater chance of, of having medication and having that being solved and not having a newborn come into this world with syphilis. Okay, so we would, on line 16, it would read such pregnant, to test such pregnant woman? Yes. Okay. And line 16. English. For HIV and for syphilis. For HIV slash syphilis, except in cases where the woman refuses the testing. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I ask for your favorable consideration. Motion to pass. Uh, for the amendment? Yes. Motion to pass the amendment. I have a second. I have a second. Okay, any discussion on the amendment? No, on the amendment? Okay, no, everybody in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Then we're back to the substitute to House Bill 436 as amended. Do pass as amended. Do pass as amended. Second, uh, any discussion? Everyone in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? No? No. All right, the ayes have it. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much. Uh, as you know, any time we can keep a baby from being born without HIV, being HIV positive or having syphilis, we are saving the state hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I thank the committee for that. Uh, okay, is Representative Brockway back? No, okay. How about Representative Stevens? Okay, so I guess then I'm up. Go. Okay. Okay. I have, if I can find it, um, I have House Bill 504. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to be here. All right, at this time. Yeah. Thank you. At this time, we will call Chairwoman Cooper for Bill House Bill 504. Okay. Chairwoman uh, Cooper. Thank you very much. Um, you have a substitute to House Bill 504. I'm working off LC33. 
608-5S. Uh, this is a compromise bill. Nobody is totally happy on this bill. So it, you know, is supposed to be the mark of a good bill. This is about adding a number of vaccines that pharmacists can administer without an order from a physician. As you know now, the only thing they've been able to order is the flu vaccines. And they've been able to give the, any of the vaccines that the physicians want them to give. They just had to have an order for it. On the front of this, we combined two bills. Uh, Representative Wilkerson had a bill. And if you, uh, Joe Wilkerson, has not been feeling very well this session. And so he was afraid maybe that when the bill would come up, he wouldn't be ready to carry it. So I said, why don't we just add it to the vaccine bill? So on page one, this is a bill that he passed years ago. I'll tell you a little funny for those of you who weren't here. It was when the Democrats were in control. Uh, the head of the Health and Human Services Committee was a retired telephone lineman with a GED. And he, they would not let anybody with any health care background on the committee. And he would tell you that he hated doctors. So needless to say, when a constituent of mine came and told me we needed to pass a bill this like this, I thought, well, OK, I'm married to a physician. I have a health care background. I'm not going to that committee. And, and I'm not on it. And so I asked Joe to go for me. I had a constituent whose son played baseball at West Georgia, complained of feeling sick, called his mom. She told him to go to the infirmary, went to the infirmary. They sent him to the hospital. And before he died, three days later, he had had all his extremities amputated and then died from the pneumococcal, from the, the, uh, uh, the meningococcal disease. So it is prevalent among college students uh, where there's a lot of smoking, a lot of drinking, and not much sleep going on. And this is a sort of an adjustment to it. Um, they were giving yeah, they it be, They must be studying. That's <laughs> it. So the CDC has added and changed recommendations. And so they are recommending that newly admitted students who are 18 years of age or older and residing in campus housing uh, as, designed, as defined by the post-secondary education institution <coughs> or residing in sorority for learning houses shall be required to sign a document provided by the <coughs> institution saying that he or she has received the vaccine against the meningococcal, meningococcal disease for not more than five years prior to such administration. They're now finding it that they have to have a booster. If it's been more than five years, they need another one. And that's that. Okay. Going to the vaccines, on page two, and just, I'm going to hit the highlights. It means that now the pharmacist will be able to give, besides influenza, pneumococcal vaccine, shingles, and meningitis. There's three more. Um, they would ha the pharmacist would ha have to uh, complete a training program uh, uh, as approved by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And that would be composed of at least 12 hours of self study and assessment an injection t uh, a technique, and it may be even longer than that, depending on what the CDC requires. Uh, it requires the pharmacist and the nurse to take a complete history. One of these vaccines is a live virus. If you are, <coughs> if your autoimmune system is impaired, like if you're a cancer patient or you have HIV, <coughs> A disease, you should not get certain vaccines. So it will require that the pharmacist <laughs> take a complete history and determine, and determine whether the patient's had a physical exam in the last year and so forth, and see whether the vaccine is contraindicated. Uh, it would it have the pharmacist, or if it's a nurse working in a mini clinic, to follow and have a protocol to follow. That protocol needs to be available in the pharmacy and easily where you know the pharmacist knows what's going what they're supposed to do um, and one of the things that i was very adamant about is we have incidences where people are getting vaccinated more than once and that's because they don't remember especially older people and on some of the new vaccines you really don't need to get it twice so uh, the person would be given, and, and because people are having reactions to these, uh, I think for the shingles vaccine, 
there are something like 3,000 reported incidents of adverse refact, uh, you know, uh, reactions. And so the patient would receive a card on cardstock that, so that it just doesn't, you know, melt away or it's not letter size so that you have to, th they'll throw it away or it'll be <coughs> inconvenient. But card size that would fit in the billfold and it, each time they got an immunization, it would say what they got, uh, who gave it to them, how much, and the injection site, and the kind of information you would need if you have a reaction, you end up in an emergency room, but also a reminder, just like you do for your kids. You remember, Representative Kaiser, remember having an immunization card for your kids and when they needed to go back for their things. So hopefully, you You're can't. You're a little older now, you might not remember. They would need to, with reasonable effort, uh, try to let the doctor know if the patient has a doctor within 72 hours that they've, what they've administered. Uh, and also that they would do the, and administer these vaccines in private or behind a screen. We have a video of where in one of the pharmacies, pharmacies they are just giving it out and people sitting in chairs outside the pharmacy. Uh, that's a violation of HIPAA and it's certainly not very hygienic and uh, they need to tighten up their rules. I will say that we are not getting these kind of reports particularly from our nice neighborhood independent pharmacists like Bruce who works but from the big chain pharmacies and uh, that perhaps don't have quite as close of supervision for them. Uh, we have given, if you're going to require people to do something, there should be some way for people to follow up on that. And we have given drugs and narcotics the right, they are the ones that go into pharmacies and see what they're doing right or wrong. And we have given them the right to come up with sanctions and fines to go along with those sanctions if people are not uh, following up in these pharmacies and doing what they're supposed to do. So basically, that's it. Like I say, I'm not happy. I would not have given them the live vaccine at all. Um, all right. But this is a compromise. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, questions from members of the committee? Ms. Kaiser, Representative Kaiser. Thank you. I'm not sure what to call you, Chairman Reinders. <laughs> um, I, I'm, at, I'm looking at Chapter 6, uh, Madam Chairwoman, on page 5. Does the pharmacist or nurse keep a copy of the card? When no, they but, th th but they have it in their record. <laughs> okay. So, okay, thank you for that. My only other question is, oh. how do you, when you're referring back to Chapter 6, a pharmacist or nurse who knowingly administers, I guess I'm wondering how do you determine someone knowingly doesn't comply with Chapter 6? What, well, what line are you on? We'll have to read that up to drugs yeah, and narcotics. Last page. 289, it may just be language taken from somewhere else, but it says a pharmacist or nurse who knowingly does not comply with paragraph six. No. Paragraph six is the requiring the card. How do you know they, how do you know if they knowingly don't? Where is it? Line, Line 289. Uh, 289. It's supposed to be referring to. I would always say I didn't knowingly not comply. Okay, so that's just typical language. Okay, all right. Thank this you. is really, it's not, it's referring to the protocol agreement. And we didn't have knowingly in first and there was some concern that a protocol agreement is between a physician and a pharmacist or like a physician and nurse practitioner. And you know, they came up with, you know, when you're doing these, I'm sure you understand Mark, uh, Representative Kaiser, they always come up and tell you, oh, but what if the worst thing that possibly happens? So they came and said, the, you know, the big pharmacy said, oh, what if, you know, that doctor had died and the pharmacist didn't know the doctor had died, so then the, the protocol wouldn't be valid and we wouldn't know the doctor hadn't died. Okay, so knowingly working without one, that's why it's in there. Yeah. It Any other questions for Madam Cooper as it relates to the bill? Anybody in the audience want to, I'm sorry? Representative Barr. Representative Barr. Madam Chair, uh, yep. I appreciate you looking at this for us. It, does this require that all um, students now uh, 
receive this shot. All what? All, all students. <laughs> no, this students. isn't. The, oh, you're talking about. On, on the Joe first Wilkerson page, Park. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> Is it now required? It, yes, it does. If students want to live on campus, they have to have it. Okay, thank you. This is a deadly, deadly disease. You know, we've just lost a lobbyist, and they don't know exactly what killed her, but one of the possibilities is this disease. Madam Chair, and it, does it mean campus housing? Yes, campus okay. housing. I'm sorry, campus housing. Not every student, so public, if you live off public, campus, you're good, right? Public and private campuses, or is it just to the public campus? Good question. Yeah, I know it looks like it's post-secondary education. It would be all of them. Well, but I mean, that would be post secondary, be whether it's private, be public or private. Okay, thank you. Or private. <coughs> Representative Broadway. Oh, Representative Broadway wants to say something. Broderick. Representative Broadway. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. And I Whoa. Will, and <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chair, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Subchair. Um, I've already gotten him today because he was carrying that bag we got on the floor like a pocketbook. Yeah. <laughs> but I do, uh, Chairman Cooper, I do want to funny. commend you for. Ms. Roderick, please continue. <laughs> Chairman Cooper, I want to commend you for your willingness to work through this issue. And uh, I think we, we're going to provide additional access and hopefully uh, we'll prevent unnecessary illness. Uh, by providing this access uh, so that we have appropriate immunization of our population. I know there was one study that we had that said that in Georgia, our low adult immunization rate, the economic I impact is uh, half a billion dollars a year due to both direct and indirect costs. So hopefully, working together, we can increase our adult immunization rate, and, um, and I appreciate you working with us so closely on this issue. Thank you very much. I certainly hope, because that may not be the only factor. There are many people that just don't think they need to get, they don't like shots and they don't want to get their injections. I hope. And the other thing that the bill does include is that the pharmacist must put into GRITS, which is the registry that we have in the public health has done, that they've given these injections. And if they don't, and the drugs and narcotic does a random check and finds that they can be fined for it and lose their ability to give these because it's a problem, but thank you very much for that. Chairman Hatchett. Thank you, sir, for <laughs> that. <laughs> Madam Chair, um, does the meningococcal, I'm probably not saying this right, virus vaccine, does it have risk involved with it? I'm, I haven't looked at that in a long time. I'm sure it does. Any vaccine. Any, like no different than any other. I mean. It is a, isn't it a sort of watered down vaccine, representing Bruce? Intenuated vaccine. It's the one for herpes. That's a, you know that is the straight okay. live vaccine, but any of them okay. can have consequences. That's why, I mean, I've tried to push public safety, not just so it's a big money maker for the big chain stores. They found out that they could make a lot of money giving flu vaccines, and you know we've had drive-by. We've had pharmacies actually have drive-by. Uh, injections where you drive by and get your flu vaccine when there's a state law that says you're supposed to watch the person for 15 minutes because people do have reaction sometimes it may just be they faint because of a uh, the fact that they got a shot but if they're driving the car that's not a very safe thing mm -hmm. so my thing ha has been trying to find and put together patient safety but there is there's risk in everything you do in life. and these one of them is a live vaccine I mean a live virus thank you madam chair mr Chairman Rogers, if I could say one more Please. thing. I, along with Representative Broderick, would just like to thank the physician community and the pharmaceutical community for working together hard over the off season on coming coming to a, a great bill, concluded bill here. So thank you all. Thank you. And I think we, any other questions from members of the committee? I think we have somebody in the audience that wanted to speak up. Marcus Downs, are you here? Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Marcus Towns with the Medical Association. I want to thank Madam Chair and every other Representative Patchett, every other member on this committee that has uh, been patient with us as we have tried to do the right thing by patients when it comes to this bill. 
Uh, I want to specifically thank the Pharmacy Association and those associated uh, stakeholders with this bill <coughs> on helping us come up with something that we think is uh, reasonable for patients. And you know, I will tell you that uh, the three vaccines that we have agreed on, uh, the meningitis, the shingles, and the um, pneumonia, one is a dead vaccine, one is an attenuated vaccine, and one is live. Uh, you know, I have to tell you that, and you've sat in committee for many years and heard Mac testify against this practice. Uh, as a matter of increasing immunizations, we have settled on those three. We think that is fair. Um, you know, there's an education component that requires uh, those administering vaccines to have 20 hours of CDC approved education. Uh, you know, we appreciate the fact that it's CDC approved rather than pharmacy approved or medically approved. Um, this is a, a huge chain of events for our membership and for the patients in Georgia and we agree with this this version of the bill and thank you much. We'll take any questions if you have any. All right. Thank you, Mr. Downs. Cindy Zeldin. Did Cindy want to say anything? I guess not. All right, Cindy. All right. The posture we're in is we have uh, no, we've got a motion to pass. Got a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, like sign. I just clearly have it. Congratulations, Madam Chair. Thank you very much to the committee members, and I want you to know that these people are going to go away, and they're going to go away. They've agreed to go away for many years. <laughs> and I intend to stay here and make sure they do. If God willing and the creek doesn't ride on that one. Huh? Representative Brockway, are you back? Did, the, did your bill pass over there? Have you already gotten one out so we don't have to pass this one? <laughs> Longer than five minutes, okay. Representative Margaret, which one's he got? 240. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I and I uh, this appreciate is a substitute your substitute to House Bill 240. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Give them the LC number. The, yeah. That's pretty impressive. Thank you, yeah. Madam Chair. Um, members of the committee, I appreciate your your patience and your uh, allowing me to bounce back and forth. I've discovered I can't be in two places at the same time, as hard as I might try. But uh, I bring before you a substitute for House Bill 240. Uh, you should have uh, LC 430121S. And uh, this bill essentially attempts to do one basic thing, and that's to give uh, state employees and members of the uh, state health benefits plan a say in uh, in changes that might be proposed or made to their uh, the, the health plan or the state benefits plan, and it does attempts to do that in two ways. Uh, the first part of the bill, section one, would uh, re would require that one member of the nine member board of community health be an active participant in the state health benefit plan, and that person could either be uh, a retired member of the employee's retirement system or the teacher's retirement system. Uh, or an active member of those of either of those uh, retirement systems. The second part of the bill uh, in sections two and three would create a, uh, a an advisory council, a 12-member non-compensated advisory council. These folks wouldn't get a per diem; uh, they wouldn't be paid in, in any way. They'd volunteer their time. Uh, made up of uh, uh, people that you see described in lines 44 through 52. Uh, various members of, of the uh, various uh, retirement funds and state, belt, state health benefit plan members that we have across the state. And this council would uh, advise uh, the commissioner and the members of the Department of Community Health Board about proposed changes or changes that they might consider to the state health benefits plan. Uh, this, that's essentially the bill. Well, it is the bill. Uh, and again, the, the idea behind this is to uh, give state employees and members of the state health benefits plan a say in changes that might be proposed to the benefits uh, that they, that they uh, 
enjoy. So with that, Madam Chair, I will be happy to answer any questions regarding the bill. Okay. Questions for the representative? Any questions? Okay. So you must have worked the committee hard before you came I understand here, so. a few emails went out. <laughs> uh, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Madam Chair, at the appropriate time, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Do we have anybody in the audience that wants to? Oh, we do. Okay. John, Mr. Keyes. Madam Chair, it's going so well, I'd rather not say anything. We are very supportive, <laughs> and thank you <laughs> very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> Margaret Cecilelli or Close. Margaret Ciccarelli for Page. I don't want to um, encumber the process. Um, we represent <laughs> over eighty-six thousand educators throughout Georgia, and we're just a few of those emails y'all received. Appreciate your consideration and are in strong support of the bill. Thank you very much. And I want to thank my staff for not giving me all those emails. Yeah, really. <laughs> Way to go! I. <laughs> great, <coughs> great, great staff. Okay, so uh, at the, this is the uh, appropriate time. I'm going to uh, owe you a whole bag of these. The chairman of the Governmental Affairs Committee asked the, the, the committee to uh, accept unanimously the vice chairman of the Governmental Affairs Committee's bill because it's obviously something that all the people of the great state of Georgia wants. I see that's downfield blocking for my vice chair. Right Thank you, there. Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Do I have a second? Got a second. Is there any further discussion from the committee? All right. Seeing no <coughs> calls for further discussion. Uh, everyone in favor of the passage of the substitute, there's a number on it, to House Bill 240, say aye. Aye. Uh, anyone opposed, say no. The ayes have it. Okay, uh, we're down to the wire, guys. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Huh? Okay, Representative Stevens, is if, he here yet? If we get one more email, we're holding that up in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Rick, Rick, <coughs> Rick Jaspers, do you want, I'm going to present to Mr. Stevens, you want to do this, or do you want Mr. Reinders? I didn't see you before. You go right ahead, please. Oh, thank you. Right there Oh, you please. Yeah, oh, please. Okay. I, just, I, I didn't see you before. Okay, 511. Uh, okay, at this time we're going to hear House Bill 511, and Madam Chair will do the presenting. House Bill 511, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, there seemed, okay, uh, last year, a couple of years ago, we pharmacists um, fix medications for nursing homes. And assisted living facilities, and they're in a locked box, as best I describe. They're filled in their individual uh, doses for the medicine and so forth. Well, somehow or other, those have to get from the pharmacy where they're filled and be transported to the nursing homes. And there has come up a question of whether the pharmacists themselves have to transport them, the actual pharmacist. Where did our, our pharmacists go when we needed them? Instead of letting a pharmacy tech take this locked box to the nursing home, this would allow a pharmacy tech, once the pharmacists have fixed the medicines, lock the box and send it to the nursing home for them then to, with their key, to be able to then dispense it to patients. Did I cover it? Like uh, that. Any questions from Madam Chair? At this time, I'll entertain a motion. Does anybody want to speak to it? Let. I, I don't think they really do, but I'll give them an opportunity. Anybody want to speak to it? <laughs> I just want to make sure I got it right. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Chris Downing with Pruitt Health. Uh, we were uh, supportive of the bill when it passed three years ago, House Bill 457. It was signed into law. Uh, this will just really a, cl a cleanup bill, if you will. It allows us to instead of sending the pharmacist out to the uh, building and stocking the machines, it allows us to send a uh, pharmacist med tech uh, to essentially deliver the canister, put it in the machine. So it just, it's a lot easier to do it that way, and we're just asking for the committee's support in this legislation. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to speak well, to Well, Representative Stevens, you're too late. It's, uh, it's already failed, and, you know, yeah. they were just trying to tell us what it was supposed to be. The rails are, are greased right now, just letting you know. Just say you're in favor of it. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. 
I'll entertain a motion. We've got one due pass. We're in the discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Other than the representative Stevens, anybody opposed? <laughs> Move. Congratulations, Madam Chair. Sorry. Um, oh, sorry. We are adjourned. Thank you very much.